Welcome to the Recover You podcast with Kyleen and Patrick Terhune. It's here that we talk about sex addiction, betrayal trauma, mental, emotional, and physical health, faith, and anything and everything needed to recover you to your most authentic self that God created you to be. Welcome, Patrick. Welcome, Kyleen. Hey, thanks. Welcome to my podcast. (laughs) Welcome to my office. (laughs) This is your office, but still my podcast, though? Or is it our podcast? Our podcast. It's your podcast. (laughs) Starting over. Welcome, Patrick. Welcome, Kylie. Thanks. Okay, so um, today we're going to talk about navigating uncomfortable emotions. Sounds comfy, doesn't it? I don't really want to. (laughs) Well, that's great because if you are uncomfortable, I'm going to teach you how to move through that emotion. That's fantastic. Mm, Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I just got back from a five-day retreat in Virginia Beach with uh, some of my mentors and personal coaches myself. And one of the things I was working on through that period of time was people-pleasing, which is a a really, um, it's been a long process for me as I've kind of, betrayal really like kind of highlights, I think, all of the things that we need to work on and all of the things that we are insecure about in life. And one of the things that really got highlighted for me, and I would say any trauma really does that, yep, right? Yep. And one of the things that really got highlighted for me is how can I learn how to show up in my life authentically as who I am without being, um, without coming across as mean or rude or disrespectful or any of those things, right? And that goes into like so much programming, right? Like societal programming and religious programming and family programming and all these things that we absorb through life of, well, it's my job to make you happy, right? Nobody says it's your job to make me happy, but that's the implication we get, especially like growing up in like parental structures, right? Where there's a different relationship and like kids can't always say no, right? And there's like, there's, there's healthy versions of that, right? Mm -hmm. We're, we're, uh, things are guided in a certain way, but just like, as you grow up, you, how do you navigate, um, showing up as who you are being able to say no and set boundaries without feeling guilty about it. And a lot of that comes from like religious culture too, where, you know, you can't question authority and you can't disagree and you can't ask questions. And, um, you know, the, the hierarchical version of marriage and religion, where it's like the man is in charge and the woman doesn't really get a say. And like all these things that we don't, believe in, Mm -hmm. but you absorb a lot of the information over time. Yeah. And, you know, people pleasing is one of those where you think, well, I'm just trying to keep the peace. Right. But in reality, it's actually manipulating the situation. So manipulating the other person and trying to control the outcome of the experience, which then takes away the ability for that person to be authentic and the ability for you to be authentic because Mm -hmm. you're trying to manipulate it. Right. Which is one of those just total brain explosion moments, I think, for me. Yeah, well, I, I think it's, you know, sometimes people will, will uh, through their own self-beliefs, will, will will seem to absorb that any sort of conflict is unhealthy. Right. And that's not true. There is unhealthy conflict. I would say murder is a source of unhealthy conflict. That's not conflict, though. That's that's me doing you know that's right. you doing right. that's, that's a, you imparting yeah. bad behavior on somebody else. Right. That That's not even like an argument conflict, per se. That's... Yeah. If they had had conflict, maybe they could have resolved the issue. Right, right. So it's like it, it you know, people spend a lot of time trying to, to learn how to avoid conflict when maybe right. what they should be doing is learning how to navigate through conflict in a, in healthy, a healthy way. way. Right. And that's sort of what we're talking about today is how do you navigate uncomfortable emotions? Because the reason you people please, and, and I would argue like so much of the parallels go from from life to betrayal to addiction, they're all the same. Mm-hmm. And that is that these addiction and people pleasing are two sides of the same coin. Mm-hmm. And that is trying to avoid uncomfortable emotions and uncomfortable situations. Right. right. And so again, to me, that's like this earth shattering idea because as a recovering people pleaser, in my mind, I was just always trying to be nice. You know, like I, I want other people to be happy. I want to come across in a way that I'm amiable and we get along and like, this is a pleasant situation for you. Mm -hmm. And where that takes a turn is where I don't feel like I have the ability to disagree or to share an opinion or to say no without you judging me or, um, where kind of what you had mentioned earlier, the idea of, 
and this is this is very true for me and something I've been working on is the idea that conflict, any type of conflict, disagreeing with someone and, and really kind of standing up for that side and having that conversation equals in my nervous system to me, I have a belief that that means that that person's going to abandon me. Mm -hmm. So for me, conflict equals abandonment. And it's like, that's not true. That's a very unhealthy emotion. And part of the reason you people please is because you want to avoid the discomfort of having these uncomfortable emotions. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about what uncomfortable emotions are and where they come from. Okay. So there's, there's two kind of ways I think about this. One is that they are parts of you. And this is something that I work on with my clients a lot is parts integration. And actually, it might be kind of cool to talk about the experience that we had recently where we did that with you and you could kind of share what that was like. Um, but really, the idea is that we are created as whole human beings. And as we go through life and experience different um, uh, interactions with people and different things that cause us pain we have little parts of us that are fragmented off. And as we go through life, this number obviously increases. And, and unless they are resolved and dealt with, they just become their own you know, part. And these different parts will show up in different areas of our life. And so like one of the most common parts that we experience and that like pretty much all of humanity can relate to is the part of anxiety. So the idea is that a part was created out of necessity based on an experience because all of your parts are valid. All of them are here to protect you. All of them are here to serve your highest interest. But what happens is they're created in a moment where it makes sense and may have been beneficial to you in that moment. But then we carry them with us when they're unresolved and they begin to show up in ways that are not helpful. So for example, like as we've gone through our betrayal recovery, in the beginning, hypervigilance and a lot of anxiety totally made sense and was created from, I kept getting like this trickle disclosure. I didn't know what was true. There was no safety in the first couple of months because I didn't know what life was like, right? Now, if I was still struggling with that level of anxiety, where we are now, years later, after safety has been very clearly established and you have taken these polygraphs and you're doing so well. And I have no reason at this point to think that that's not true. Mm -hmm. um, if that part was still at the same level and activating and just super, super anxiety about you relapsing all these kinds of things, that would be an example of how that part served a very clear purpose. Its purpose was to protect me. And it made sense in that moment, but now it's showing up in a way that is unhealthy and actually interfering with my life, interfering with my ability to heal. And it no longer makes sense. Mm -hmm. So that's where we can do things like parts integration because the part just needs to be heard, validated, and you need to learn from that part of you why it's still showing up. Right. Because if you can learn why it's showing up, then you can actually respond to it in a different way, give it what it needs, and the part will actually calm down. Yeah, I think um, I, I went through an experience with my therapist where he actually called the parts, you know, they have a seat at the table. So we were working through something. It was uh, it was a level of forgiveness, self forgiveness, and you know he 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 asked me you know what would that look like, and so like I created a vision of what that was, and then he asked all the parts of me to come to the table, and it was the addict had a seat at the table, you know, and so sometimes what happens is is you know a key point there is the addict does play a role. The addict, yeah, yeah. the addict is a part of you. It's a part of you. And and what's interesting. It's not, but I like always want to say, because we've talked about this with the identity episode, though, mm -hmm. it's not who you are. No. It's no. but it is a part. And right. when, and when yeah. we give the parts what they need, they act the unwanted parts, what they right. need, they go away. Yeah. And so, you know, it, it you know, it's the notion of what it did had a it did have a role maybe in survival at one point, which is a hard thing to reconcile with it at, you know, when you think about, you know, emotions and the hurt and all those things. But um it you know, he asked it to have a seat at the table so I could resolve what its role would be in my level of self-forgiveness, right? And how do you, you know, so that, you know, that's, you know, my head explodes, you know, that, that sort of thing as you're trying to navigate through that because you don't want to talk about it, right? You want to shun it, you want to send it away. But, you know, his point is, no, you have to address it. That is such a good point because, I mean, even talking about anxiety, a lot of the parts that we want to resolve are parts that we actually have negative feelings towards. Mm -hmm. We don't like them. So when I say things like you want to make friends with your parts, that's like, no, I don't. I want it to go away. That's right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like, 
And that's probably what you were experiencing there. Like, no, I don't want to, I don't want to talk to my addiction part of me. Like yeah, I hurt everybody it. And, and and did all this stuff. And it was a, it was basically a, uh, um, you know, thank you for your service. I don't, you know, I've got, it. I've got it from here, you know, in, in, in a way. And I don't, I don't know if that was the particular lesson from that day, but that's kind of what, what, what strikes me. And so what you do is you invite the positive portions of you back in and how do you build them up and how do you allow them to take a greater seat at the table, you know, as, as you move into this new level of healing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, what, what did you learn was so all of our parts have a role and they're here to protect us and they have like your highest, um, good at heart, mm -hmm. even when they are behaving in bad ways. Right. So what was the purpose of the addiction part that you discovered through recovery? I think what I discovered was the, especially when I, you know, we told my story about the, the pain of, of, um, the accident and the amount of, you know, there was no sleep and there was all of these different things and just the, the rejection that came about and the, and, you know, trying to make sense of what was once a, a life that got interrupted in a tragic event and then blew everything up. And, mm -hmm. and so I think it was, it, it, um, allowed, you know, you never want to, it, it, it was, it was, um, emotion management. It was an emotion management sort of thing that fulfilled a early role that then went off track. Right. Know? Meaning, um, the primary role of it was, survival by numbing the pain of right. the experience that might have been to. too great to me it was perceived as too great because right. you did not have or you were not and reaching no other, out to right. no other mechanisms so. other other sources of support correct right. correct yeah so i mean i think i think that's what it you know and, and i've heard that you know it's almost like the person that has one drink you know once every two weeks and it feels good at the end of work well then that can start to grow right mm -hmm. and then now it's four drinks a bottle of wine each night mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and but it started, you could argue with sex addiction that you never really want to go there the first time. No, but, but they talk about that though. Like these, these, when it comes to addiction and stuff, it is an attempt of the brain to fill a hole that is a healthy need that needs to be filled. But the addiction or the bad behavior fills it in an unhealthy way. That's right. So That's yeah, like pornography is not the answer to feeling unloved, but the idea of feeling loved and supported and having community and validation like that's normal like people yeah. need that right. right and but there's a healthy way to do that correct correct so um so what what was interesting is through this therapy session as i as i uh um as i articulated my vision of what self forgiveness looked like and it was um words like confident and being able to tell my story and stepping into that story and and uh living a life of fulfillment and things like that um you know, those took, you know, it was, it was a really interesting as, as those, it's like every piece of you loved every piece of you mm -hmm. to include the addict, right? You know, those pieces of confidence and integrity and purity, you know, thanked the addict for what it did, you know, what it, mm -hmm. it's really no, yeah, at, yeah, at it's one really, point. Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to word this right. Not, yeah, yeah, exactly yeah, right. Yeah. That's what yeah. you do with the parts is you can actually have conversations with them as that, as if they are another human being with a personality right. and you say, thank you for what you provided to me. Mm -hmm. And I no longer need your services because right. I have X, Y, Z over here. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like you can calm down and, and, you know, maybe step in the other room or, or, right. you know, sit down or whatever, yeah. however you want to visualize that. Um, but, uh, but then it, I actually, what's crazy is I actually visualized it like, getting up from the table Maybe. and kind of walking out of the room and mm -hmm. saying, and and there was a lot of, there was oddly enough, there was a lot of love there because it was a part of me. So in order for me to self forgive, yeah. you have to forgive that portion. The part itself is a loving part. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, all of your parts want what's best for you. So when you have a conversation that you validate why they're there mm -hmm. and then you're able to say, but I can, provide for myself this need in a healthier way, they're usually willing to be when it's done appropriately, they're usually willing to say, because okay, they love you. Yeah. Because they love you. They're like, I, I don't actually want to hurt you. Right. Right. That's not, that's not your part's goal. Right. Yeah. Right. yeah. So you can have these conversations with them. It's really interesting. And I'm, I'm sitting here thinking about, um, you know, my people pleasing part. Right. Mm -hmm. And that part of me is like, it's, what is its goal really? It's to, to keep the peace. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Um, but it's also to um, make me feel loved and valued. 
Because the idea of, well, if I don't make people happy, my interpretation of that goes to, what well, did I do something wrong, mm-hmm. right? It's not where, it's not where we can have a conversation and just disagree and be okay, right. which I logically consciously know is true, mm-hmm. but unconsciously, you know, from life experiences and different things, I immediately go to, did I do something wrong to make them feel that way and, and take responsibility on for their response, which again, and I talk to my clients about this a lot. You are never responsible for other people's emotions and, and their right. responses. You are only responsible for your side of the street. Mm-hmm. And that can be a difficult reality when we are so used to living in the opposite realm. But when you think about that, taking personal responsibility for your side of the street, you know, that means that, yeah, you are responsible to like be a nice person, do what's right, show up and do your best every day. But beyond that, Beyond that, you are not responsible for how people interpret that. Mm -hmm. That's their responsibility. And it's also their responsibility if they are offended by something you said or took it a certain way to analyze that themselves and then to come to you and say, if, you know, if, if it really bothers them, say, Hey, this is, this is how I interpreted this Mm -hmm. and care enough about the relationship to have that discussion with you. It's not your job to sit there and think 20 different ways that they could have interpreted it. And did they take it that way? And did you offend them? Right. So not that I've ever done that. Mm, No, never. (laughs) So, so we, um, so you talked about parts in a really interesting way, like sitting at the table. I, I've kind of done it in a couple different ways with my clients where we'll, we'll talk to an individual part. Um, we'll have two parts talk to each other, um, through like a visualization process of like, Hey, can this part take more, um, command in, in your life than this part? Like your brain, for example, over anxiety. Can you, can the brain be in more control? Um, logic reasoning versus mm-hmm. anxiety. Can, and we did this whole visualization where anxiety went into a bedroom and fell asleep and said, hey, I'm here when you need me because you don't necessarily, like anxiety is important to have as like a red flag in your body, mm-hmm. but we don't want it to go away totally, but we want it to behave appropriately. Right. So can we put you to sleep and have the brain wake you up when necessary? Right. Right. So we've done stuff like that. But um, what I was talking about at the beginning is parts integration, which is typically with parts, you have conflicting parts. You have one part that believes one thing and one part that believes another. So, for example, I mean, this could look, well, let's just talk about, do you remember what your parts were the other day when we talked about it? Part of you wanted more freedom, freedom. and part of yeah. you felt like the boundaries that you currently have in place are there for a purpose and, you're, and, right. and create safety. Sure. Yes. So, um, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, integrating parts means that the, those on the surface seem like they are conflicting, right? That, well, I want more flexibility and freedom in my life, but I also like really want the boundaries because they've helped me get to where I am, where I feel mm-hmm. secure. Yeah. And they make, you know, my family feel secure and, and my sobriety feels secure and all this kind of stuff. Um, so when they sh- when you have parts that are showing up in opposite ways that that can obviously cause conflict in your life and and distress right like for you what we had noticed was that this was associated with the emotion of anger and underneath the emotion of anger was this conflict and beneath the conflict were these two parts that wanted um your best right. your highest and so what we did was what's called parts integration. And that's essentially like, let's talk to the part that wants more freedom and learn all about it and like what it wants for you and what its goals and what its highest intention and purpose is for your life. And then let's also talk to the part that really is totally cool where it's at. What does it want for you? What's so interesting when I run these um, uh, emotional processing exercises is your parts, these two parts that are seemingly in conflict ultimately agree. Mm-hmm. When you get to the highest level of their intention for you and their goal for your life, they come to an agreement. And I can't remember specifically what the what the line was for you that, but usually it's almost worded the exact same way on both sides. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was probably something to the effect of "I want to be happy and responsible," and um, yeah, you yeah. know. Flexible. I want to live a life of integrity. Want, yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and, and so, they both wanted that for you. Right. So then when you're, when you get to the place and this is part of the exercise where you flesh it out until it gets to that point. But when you get to that point of them both agreeing, then you can integrate them in and it usually causes some more um, relaxation in the nervous system because the conflict is now resolved. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because you've actually figured out 
why it was there in the first place. Right. And, and part of what I was feeling, you know, which, which led to us doing this is, um, and I think I mentioned this, it's like, you know, I'm a 51 year old man that takes care of everything. And I have a, I have a, a high responsibility job and all of this stuff. And, and I'm not allowed to do X. Right. And so versus like, well, you know, there are a lot of stressors in, in the job and life and things like that. And you ultimately want to have the most rewarding life. And so, you know, these are ab- absolutely actually not restrictions that keep me from pursuing that goal. These are actually, you know, uh, great assistance in that. It's like having somebody, you know, walk alongside you in life, you know, like, like the, uh, who is it? Craig Rochelle. He's like, he's like, I can't, I can't look at anything without somebody on my staff knowing mm. on any of my devices, you know what I mean? And stuff like that. And like that, you know, he lives, he's comfortable with that because then he knows that not because he's trying to live in fear, but he's like, I may get a question. Somebody mm-hmm. may ask me. So it, it, it you know, helps drive yeah, that I behavior. Mean, I think you always have to ask the question. Like if, if somebody is saying, well, I want to live a life without accountability of any kind, mm-hmm. why do you want to live a life like that? Right, right, exactly. Yeah. So, and I think, you know, I think what you feel is, is you feel good in recovery, right? You're like, Hey, I'm, I'm feeling good in recovery, you know, like, like in, in, you know, the, they're, the, the things that come up are sometimes mild to low nuisances. <laughs> so like, here's a good example. It's like, you know, you're out of town. I'm trying to troubleshoot the Roomba. <laughs> I have to update the app. I can't. Right. Right. Mm. So you're like, oh, for crying out loud. You know yeah. what I mean? But then you're like, well, you're coming back on Wednesday. So, you know, like, like, who yeah. cares? You know what I mean? The Roomba is not going to change my life. Yeah. You know what I mean? I have access to money. I have access to, you know what I mean? So like. Go buy a new Roomba. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I'm just saying like, like it's not the, you know, I, right. we, we have a push vacuum. Right. You know, if I really, you know what I mean? So it's like, it's like the end of the day, you know, uh, I'm able to watch the television shows that are healthy. I mean, you know what I mean? Like they're really, yeah. you know, there's nothing, nothing that I want to do that's being prevented. Right. Yeah. And that's kind of what I'm saying. So yeah, when, when people feel this resistance, now this is a very common one that we have seen Mm -hmm. actually play out. Um, and so for all of you out there who are going through the recovery process, either addiction or betrayal, um, you know, the person that's in it or the person that's married to it, it's important to kind of understand this is a pattern that comes up. And a Mm -hmm. lot of, um, what we see happen is this idea of, well, I'm, and it often happens around the six month mark. And that is, I feel amazing. I'm in sobriety. Maybe I've just moved into recovery. I feel so good about myself. I don't ever want to go back to this ever again. So I'm not going to go to therapy and I'm not going to go to my groups. I'm not going to journal anymore. I'm not going to do any more emotional work. And I understand that because all of us that go through this process hit a point where we're like, I really don't want recovery to be the defining aspect of my life. That's a lot of work. It's so much work. It's exhausting. And sometimes you want to think about and, and, have conversations about something else. <laughs> well, yeah. On Monday night, you want to watch Monday night football. You don't want to go to the Conquer group. Right. You know what I mean? That's yeah. that's really where, where it comes yeah. from. And so, yeah, no, you're absolutely so right. They, they, they gain that level of confidence mm-hmm. and then they get out. Yeah. But the reality is this is a lifelong process to some extent. Now those, and we've talked about this on previous episodes, those boundaries change, yeah. Yeah. but it is a lifelong recognition that like, no, I have to do the things yeah. that keep me in this place. I can't just drop everything right. that is a support to me. And that, you know, and that goes for, um, I think all humans, mm-hmm. I don't like that. That's the thing about this is that these tools and these resources, like they're not just for addicts and betrayed partners. Mm-hmm. Like this is for anyone who they're obviously going to look slightly different, but like the trauma work and emotional processing that I do with betrayal clients is the same that I would do. And that I do, like, I was just on a call last night. She's not a, she's not a betrayal client. Mm -hmm. She's just a a mom, you know, a wonderful mom who, um, you know, has emotions and struggles like everybody else. And, and we had, you know, we're, we're working on all these tools. And so these are the things that anybody that wants to up level in their life, anybody that wants to personally grow, anybody that wants to do the hard, uncomfortable work, like I'm trying to do a yeah. moving past people pleasing and navigating what the heck yeah. that looks like 2.0 version, right? Um, that well, is, it's hard, but I, I, I think anytime you remove um, unhealthy coping mechanisms, and I say this to the men in the groups is your life's going to get harder. It's going to feel harder and it's going to feel harder yeah. because now you're feeling these emotions and you may used to go to go down a rabbit hole 
that would prevent you from going deep into that emotion, but it's going to get hard. And so I actually said to the, to the group the other night and I, yeah, I could see the light bulb going on with them as they were, you know, the, the guys were sitting there like, man, I just had a rough week. And, and my wife woke up and she was mad at me and going through and, and at the end of their check-ins, and it was basically about eight of that, you know, if I'm not feeling good or my, you know, I, sometimes when I'm around my dad, you know, these things. And I was like, do you all see what just happened? What happened was you were all connecting with t- tough and difficult emotions, which is part of living in the world. Mm-hmm. And the fact that you carried that level of awareness mm-hmm. shows a tremendous amount of healing. Yeah. And so I think they were all like, really? You know, like it was like. I think awareness is one of the first steps to, to navigating this. Mm-hmm. So, the you know, the topic is navigating uncomfortable emotions. And I was thinking about that before we started is we should mention the feelings wheel because one of the things that happens is not everyone is instantly able to identify what emotion they're feeling or what what that emotion feels like in their body. Like someone may feel a flutter in their chest and not connect that with a feeling of loneliness. Or someone might feel a tightness in their throat, but not connect that to to the fact that they were just in a situation where they um, were not able to share their opinion, Mm -hmm. right? And so, like, I think the first step through all of this is actually dropping into your body and learning how to name the thing, name what it is you're feeling, but also identify, like, where is it in my body and how does this feel? How is it showing up? Because the more we can do that... It, it goes back into what we were talking about with the parts. It's like when, when we name and validate and understand, then these we're able to move through them way more effectively and efficiently. Well, it's like, it's like you know, and, and the great analogy, and I've always talked about this, when you know that when you turn on the car, you press a button or you put a key in and turn it, and then you reach down with your right hand and you put that thing in reverse, you know all of that. It yeah. makes driving so much easier. When you know that, that the octag- octagonal sign means stop yeah. and the triangle sign means yield, yeah. it, it's much like it's the same level, and, and we all make sense of it when we think about driving something very concrete that everybody mm-hmm. learns to do mm-hmm. but it's it's the same thing in this field like mm-hmm. you know when you can get in there and become self-aware it, yeah. it, it helps you move through it i was doing an exercise with a client the other day and um she i i asked her to to drop in and i named the emotions that were present and it was things like anger fear sadness and conflict and i was like okay which one do you think is primary and i think she said conflict and um i asked her to describe where that was in her body and what it felt like and it was like on the back of her neck and um where like her hair kind of stood up that kind of feeling and it's just so interesting to me because who would describe conflict that way right like i wouldn't i wouldn't typically go hey um friend you know you just described to me that the hair on the back of your neck is standing up that's conflict right it's going to be different for mm-hmm. everybody but the that's what i'm talking about is learning how to like drop in name the actual emotions and then go okay well how am i feeling that where is that actually showing up because i can't tell you what that is i'm not going to be able to do that what i can do is help you work through it mm-hmm. after you do that but i i'm not going to be able to make that connection so i think that's definitely like the first step to processing all of this is figuring out like how does it actually show up in your life right so the other piece of, so so we started with what are um, difficult emotions and where they come from. So we talked about the parts, right, and how those are created. Um, but the other thing that I often say is um, a trigger is just a reflection of an unhealed wound. So anytime we are triggered and our nervous system is activated and we're really like upset by something, it's really just a, a, a reflection of an unhealed wound. Or another way of saying that is, Something that someone says to you or does, um, let's just use words, for example. If somebody makes a comment to you, it's not going to actually bother you if you feel totally secure in that thing. Mm -hmm. So if, um, you know, I was very insecure with uh, my parenting, you know, with Keegan and everything like that. And so if somebody would make a disparaging comment about my parenting, that would have really, really hurt me. And um, because the reason I it would hurt me is, first of all, that's rude. But secondly, the reason it would bother me is because there's some piece of it that I believe to be true about myself. Mm-hmm. If there is no piece of that that I believe to be true, it's going to roll right off my skin and I'm going to go, that's ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Right. And so 
I wanted to kind of talk about that aspect to everything a little bit, because when we're talking about navigating difficult emotions, oftentimes there is a piece to which we have to look inside and say, what is the emotion and the unhealed wound that this is bringing up for me? Because if there are a lot of situations where if I didn't have some sort of negative belief about myself Mm -hmm. or some sort of insecurity about myself from myself, within myself, deep down inside myself, then that comment or that experience or that whatever would not actually hurt me. You have anything to say about that? No. 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 (laughs) So I'll just, you did mention like, hey, let's define trigger. And I think that's really um, important. So what I'm going to do is read the section about defining triggers specifically from the book called Unbroken, The Trauma Response is Never Wrong and Other Things You Need to Know to Take Back Your Life by Mary Catherine McDonald. Okay, so it's a little bit of a long section, but I think it is definitely important. Terminology is important. And this explains kind of what's happening in your body. So the the subheading is triggers and traumatic memories on page 39. One of the biggest failures of the language of trauma is that we refer to traumatic memories as memories, as if they look or feel like all the rest of our memories, as if we had control over them. Traumatic memories are not memories. They are instances of unwilling and unbidden reliving. When we remember, we have cognitive control. We have access to the parts of our brain that can think rationally. And while we may feel some of the emotions related to the memory, we typically can put the memory and emotions away when we need to. Reliving, on the other hand, is not something we do. It is something that happens to us. It puts us back into the time of the trauma. Trauma victims learn the horrible trick of occupying two temporalities simultaneously as past and present toggle like near and far sight. This kind of toggling may look fun in sci-fi movies, but it can make our lives a literal living hell. The only other word we have for this kind of whiplash memory and the cascade of biological responses that come with it is trigger. Unfortunately, the word trigger has been nearly stretched to utter meaninglessness. It was once a term designed to refer to these strange non-memory memories, but has become a catch-all for any occasion in which we have an emotion that is remotely unpleasant or unwanted. We talk about being triggered by not getting what we want in relationships or by people who hold political beliefs that oppose our own. These experiences are valid and important and worthy of discussion, but we need a more appropriate nomenclature to refer to them because when we homogenize them in this way, using the same inappropriate word to capture them, we do them all an injustice. Our misconception of what it means to be triggered is especially dangerous because it has led to us misunderstanding what we should do when it happens. We have learned or mislearned to block and avoid, to annihilate instead of adapt or heal. Once someone utters the phrase, I'm triggered, hands go up and surrender and conversation shuts down. Sometimes people really are triggered. Often they are not. We need to get better at understanding the difference. And we need to recognize that in either case, surrender and shutdown are signs of collapse, not signs of health and integration. If we mistake reliving for remembering and remembering for reliving and any feelings as triggering and triggers as a cue to collapse, we misunderstand the very core of traumatic experience and we fail to heal. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So I think the idea there is that that's the end of the quote. (laughs) The idea there is that um, an actual trigger is when your nervous system is activated and takes you back to a traumatic memory or moment or experience that you've had. So one thing that um, I brought up as an example when we were talking about this episode earlier, I don't know, about a year ago or something, I got a text on my phone that had a headshot of a woman and um, and some sort of solicitory text that I imagined was very similar to the sexting strings that you would have with you know the apps or whatever it was that you were engaged in. And that it came across like 10 o'clock at night and it was like super triggering for me. And what, you know, what that did is it took me from my safe place in, in my home environment and it put my nervous system back into the time of discovery essentially is what's happening there because you don't physically have to go back to the place. You can smell something, see something, hear something, feel something that reminds your body of where you were when the trauma was happening. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't even have to be that similar, but sometimes it is like, sometimes it'll be a similar smell like that. You could be in a totally different environment, but like the smell is similar and it takes you back. Right. Yeah. 
Yeah. So in this case, obviously there's, it's very clear, right? It was, um, you know, a very beautiful picture, um, the solicitory text. I'm like, oh, you probably got things that were exactly like this. And I had really done, made effort to avoid being in that world or seeing it or being exposed Mm -hmm. to it. Right. And so then it was coming into my world and I really didn't want to see a lot of things to contribute to feelings of um, body image and negative self-worth and things like that. And so here was something I didn't seek it out. It came to me. And now I'm like, oh my gosh, like these are the types of pictures you would receive or like, this is what the women might look like and stuff like that. And so that's an example of like how your body from an experience can get triggered into a previous experience with, because there's some sort of level of overlap. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think, um, you know, and and that's a rough one because that's something that, uh, um, and I guess that's the way most triggers are. I remember getting triggered by the, uh, after my car accident, by the temperature, there was a, I bought a new car Mm -hmm. and, uh, once it dropped below like 35 degrees outside, a little thing that would come up on the dashboard that said icy. And so I was like, oh my gosh, I hit black ice. And so now I was like shaking, driving, you Mm. know, because it was like a, it brought that back of like, oh, here we go with ice, you know, so triggers can be any number of things that can pull you back Mm -hmm. into that environment and and, and do that. So, yeah. So I think when we're talking about navigating uncomfortable emotions, again, going back to that, that basic understanding of where are they coming from? Mm -hmm. Sometimes you have these experiences where your body is triggered and your nervous system is activated and maybe you don't know why. Maybe it wasn't that clear. Like you and I just shared experiences where it had very clear parallels and we could very quickly say, well, this was doing that and reminding me of this. But sometimes you can't. Like sometimes the situation may be so far removed from the reality of what you experienced that your nervous system is activated and you don't really know why. Mm -hmm. And, And so part of what you can do there is first of all, supporting the body by calming the nervous system down. I'm going to kind of walk through that in a second, but then going back to what we were talking about, really dropping in and having that conversation with your body. So maybe that in that case, it's a sensation, right? I don't know why I'm triggered right now, but my heart rate is activated and my throat is tight. Okay. So then we can sit with that and start identifying it and naming it and dropping down into our body and, and creating that safety for ourselves to then move through it more easily and understand it and let's uh, literally allow our body to talk to us. Right. Um, so I'm actually going to walk through a process that I teach to my clients. Okay. Um, but I thought what I just, uh, what just came into my mind as we were talking was how, uh, we've shared how you have the meniscus tear mm-hmm. and how we did energy work. We named the emotion. We um, processed uh uh, conflicting parts for you. Mm-hmm. We um, join those together. And you actually told me the other day you were talking to it. Yeah. 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 So, uh, right. Meniscus tear. And I've, and I've, uh, I saw a surgeon this week. Um, and there's a lot of like news out there on meniscus tears. Like, oh, you know, when they go in and quote unquote repair it, they actually take a piece out. And then that means um, that, that you can't, you know, maybe run the way you used to. And and for those of you who don't know, running has been a big part of my life. It's like meditation for you. Yeah, it's meditation. I feel strong when I'm out there. I love running when the sun goes up. So the thought of not being able to run anymore, it's just really made me sad, really kind of made me sad. And and so, you know, there's no resolution yet. I mean, I will say over the last two plus years, it's been hard to run. There's been injuries and there's been back to back. Yeah. Yeah. It's just been. And so now here we are with a meniscus tear. So um, I, I think that that I think some of it's tied to my identity. Because people have been like, wow, you've run all those marathons and wow, you've, you know, you've done this. And people are like, oh my gosh, you can just get up in the morning, go run 20 miles. You know, that's Mm -hmm. been part of my life. And so, you know, the fact that that could be changing Mm -hmm. is, is emotional and sad for me. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And anytime you've had a setback, it's been, you're, you kind of are the the type of personality. It's like, I don't want to give my body enough time to recover Mm -hmm. because it it means so much to you and you really want to get back out there. Right. And so the reality that like you actually have to slow down and and maybe permanently Mm -hmm. is, is it's something to process. Right. Um, but specifically what, one, one thing that I kind of want to bring up is, (laughs) is a lot of people are going to listen to this maybe and think, um, 
talk to my emotions. Like what the heck? Like Mm -hmm. how can like, it's in my body. How can I not know what I feel? Right. Right. But what, but it just, it, it is the way it is. This is what you're doing is you're taking the wedge between your conscious and your subconscious away and allowing them to communicate. Right. And you will be very surprised that they talk back to you mm-hmm. because consciously you wouldn't know how to have this conversation in your logical brain. Mm-hmm. But when you drop down in and you just let your body respond, it actually will respond. And literally the other day you told me, um, I was talking to my knee the other day yeah, and I said, what was it? He said? Well, no, I asked it what it needed and it said rest. Mm-hmm. It said a lot of rest. And then I followed on and said, I really want to get back to running. Are we going to be able to do that? Yeah. And it said, yes, but you have to give me rest. It's so interesting. Thinking. Yeah. So I was like, okay, I'll give you a rest. And so like I was working out this morning, upper body, and I would have done some things that didn't seem like it would have hurt my knee, but I really took it careful this morning. I yeah. was like, okay, well, it says it wants rest. I'm really going to give it that. Yeah. You know, and, so. and, I, and I mean, the reality of that is that that's you telling yourself that. Mm-hmm. Um, and that kind of goes into the idea that we have everything we need inside. Mm-hmm to you know the, these answers right? right but because we're so used to living in the conscious and living in our logical we're not used to dropping down and becoming friends with our subconscious and right. that's what a lot of this emotional work and this trauma work and mm-hmm. all this kind of stuff that's what it does yeah. is it gets you more open to hearing what you you actually already know yeah yeah, right, and responding right. to it. Okay, so let me let me teach everybody. I'm gonna drop all my best kept secrets here of what I teach my clients, and I'm gonna walk you through. I don't even know them. You don't know. Well, we're gonna do it today. Uh, we're gonna walk through an exercise called Pause. It's an acronym that I created to walk you through this process. It's easy to remember and can help you actually when you're triggered or feeling an uncomfortable emotion, really any end of that spectrum, you can use this. And once you get used to it, it might go pretty quickly, but it might take a little bit longer too. You may add journaling to this to help you process some of these steps. But once you get pretty familiar with the steps, um, you may almost do it unconsciously. Sometimes it might go so quickly. So it's uh, it's pretty effective. So the first one um, in pause is the letter P and that stands for parasympathetic. So we've talked about the nervous system in previous episodes where when you, when your brain perceives danger or in, in the context of this episode, when you are triggered and your nervous system is activated, um, then you are going into fight or flight. And so you are uh, in that stress state. And so parasympathetic is the part of your nervous system that is calm. So we can get in parasympathetic Anytime we want to. So if we are uh, working throughout the day and you want to be proactive about this, I would encourage you to do so because the more we can teach our body how to get into parasympathetic and make that the habit, make that the default, the, the healthier we're going to be in the long run when it feels familiar to us. Sometimes what happens is we live so long in stress that parasympathetic, that calm, safe space actually doesn't feel safe because we're not used to it. So we want to train the body to be comfortable and actually prefer the parasympathetic state. And we can also use it in the moment when we are activated to drop down into the parasympathetic in order to calm the stress state. So I'm just going to teach one. Well, I'll, I'll say two, two ways to do this. One is to lay on the floor and put your feet up against the wall. And by the way, when you are dropping down into parasympathetic, that does not mean necessarily that that it's shutting off all the emotions. Your emotions may flow through more easily. And and for example, if you throw your feet up against the wall, you may end up crying. But what, what is crying? Crying is an energetic moving of the feeling of the emotion. And it is moving through the body versus if we try to not cry and hold it in then we are not allowing the expression and movement of that energy. Mm-hmm. So it's it's not necessarily a bad thing to feel the emotions through this process. In fact, I'm going to encourage it. But what we're doing with parasympathetic is we're trying to make the body feel safe when it's reacted to something that is making it feel unsafe. Okay. And, and a lot of times what's happening is you are safe, right? You might be sitting in your office. You might be sitting at home on the couch. You might be, you know, in a very, very safe environment in, in all actuality. And yet you're not feeling that way because this emotion has come up. So what we want to do is we want to take the nervous system and help it to drop down and feel safe. So you can lay down and throw your feet up against the wall. And one reason this works is because if you were in actual danger, you would not be laying down. Mm -hmm. So what you're doing is you're tricking your body and saying, no, I'm actually safe. I'm intentionally choosing this. 
and it can help you kind of calm down. You can also do chest tapping, which is my favorite. And Patrick, you have seen me do this how many times? Uh, seven, <laughs> seven times. Seven times 70, really. In one day. <laughs> is uh does breathing do it too like a box breathing or something yeah like that? yeah so that's another one a really good one and you can actually you could literally pair all these together so the more activated you are the more you may actually want to overlap parasympathetic activities so maybe somebody finds that ch- for me chest tapping is super helpful right yeah. like i've done it so frequently over the past couple of years mm-hmm. and i just do it like when i'm teaching clients so my body is so used to it that it's actually gotten me out of like a panic attack in like a minute or so what's that other one for seven, eight breathing or something. Is it for something? There's a number for, it's like inhale for yeah. a certain amount of seconds, hold it. And then exhale for, an, I, I, I'll I'm walk you through it. Four, seven, eight or something like that. Yeah. So basically when you're lapping, um, when you're overlapping them, you could do two, you could do three, you could throw your legs up against the wall, lay down, tap your chest and do deep breathing, mm-hmm. or you could just sit still and do deep breathing. But the idea with the chest tapping is that you are activating your vagus nerve and the activating your vagus nerve actually taps right into the parasympathetic. So it's going to mm-hmm. calm you down. And like I said, it's very effective for me. Breathing also can calm your heart rate down. So I'm laughing. You've tapped your chest so much. It's red. Yeah. Yeah. But it feels good. You are, should tap your chest. Are you in parasympathetic now? Yeah. I'm, okay. Yeah. Awesome. I should be on the podcast. Yeah. Right. Right. Patrick, you're really activating me. I'm going to have to tap my chest some more. <laughs> okay. So deep breathing has also really um, been helpful and helps a lot of people. And like I said, different people are going to find, and that's okay. You don't have to use all of these or like all of these. Everyone's going to respond differently. But I'll give an example. There was one night, I think you were out of town and this was years and years ago. And Keegan was like, it was like, I don't know, midnight or one or two in the morning. And he was downstairs, like playing games on the computer when he was supposed to be sleeping. Right. And I got so activated so fast. And my heart rate was like really beating hard in the middle of the night. And I actually, you know, I like unplugged the computer and like, (laughs) it was not a good situation. And so I actually, what I did in that moment is I sat down on the bedroom floor and I did deep breathing. Mm -hmm. And within about one to two minutes, it calmed my heart rate down. So chest tapping is, is, uh, activating the vagus nerve laying on the floor is telling your body that you are in a safe space. Mm -hmm. Deep breathing is calming your heart rate down. So again, you could do all three, but deep breathing is where you are intentionally controlling the input and output of your breath. So you mentioned two different ones and you can do them however you want. But it's intentionally controlling. Now, when your heart rate is really active, um, the first getting into it's going to be kind of hard. Mm-hmm. But once you just kind of create the pattern, um, it'll calm your heart very quickly. I actually do. Uh, I, it just helps me going to work, but I'll do uh, box breathing on the way to work. Yeah. So box breathing is breathing in for four counts, holding your breath for four counts at the top breathing out for four counts and then holding your breath for four counts at the bottom. It's And and actually, I believe if you go back a couple episodes to the meditation, I walk you through box breathing at the beginning of that episode. Um, so if you haven't listened to that, go ahead and, and, and listen to that episode because it kind of walks you through that process. But then the other version is, um, is where you breathe in for a shorter amount than you breathe out. So you could breathe in for four counts and then you could breathe out for six or you could breathe in for three and you could breathe out for eight or, you know, however you want to do that. But essentially what you're doing is you're controlling the intake and the um, breath out is longer. And so that's the idea there. So P for parasympathetic. So when you're feeling any uncomfortable emotion or a trigger or um, active activation in your nervous system, you're going to want to drop your body down into the parasympathetic. So that's the P. Then the A is the assess the emotion. So this is where we go. What emotion is it that I'm feeling now? Like we talked about these maybe parts, these may a whole lot of different things, but all, all you're doing right now is trying to name the feeling, name the emotion that is coming up for you in that moment. And, and that can be hard because sometimes it might just be, I just feel off. Yeah. I remember an emotion that I ultimately felt that I probably never felt before um, within like a month or two of re- of getting into sobriety was emptiness. Mm-hmm. And I had never fe- really felt that before. Mm-hmm. And so that was like, that took me a while to kind of finally put a name to it. Cause I was like, I don't know what this feeling is. Mm-hmm. I, d- I don't, I don't. And I don't. that's okay. Like through this exercise, if you're, if you just name it in whatever way makes sense to you mm-hmm. over time, you may have put a word to that. Or if you have the feeling wheel in the room that you're doing this in, you might look at that and be like, Oh, that's mm-hmm. what I'm feeling. Mm-hmm. But whatever it is that makes sense to your brain, you just need, it's like, uh, it's like naming your pet, like give it a name so that you can move through this process. Mm-hmm. Okay, so assess the emotion. If you're able to say, hey, I'm, I'm feeling 
you know, angry, sad, fearful, lonely, grief, whatever, um, all of that's fine. Um, then you're going to move on to the you and that's understanding its purpose. And this goes into what we were talking about earlier. You literally are just having a conversation with it, mm-hmm. dropping down into your body, doing this deep breathing, naming the emotion, let's say it's sadness. And then literally the question would be like sadness. Why are you here today? Or for what purpose are you showing up? Mm-hmm. Or what, what are you trying to communicate to me? Right, right. What are you telling me? You know, yeah. any of those, whatever, you know, comes up that's appropriate, that's that's getting to that deeper level, right? So then sadness says, well, you know, I- I'm showing up because, um, you know, you, you saw uh, your best friend get engaged on Facebook and you are grieving the fact that um, your relationship isn't in a happy place right now. Right. 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 Okay. Yeah. So a uh, very normal, just example in these situations. Okay. So now you've named it. Your, your nervous system is beginning to calm down. You're validating why it's there and understanding why it's there. And then what you're going to do is just support the emotion moving through the body, which means you're going to sit here for a little while and do the breathing, calming the body, validating it, maybe having this listening, conversation, listening to what's happening, yeah. listening. If anything else comes up, like maybe you're asking a question, what do you need from me? Mm-hmm. Right? Like, is there something you need for me to feel safe? Right? Is there a resource you need? Is there support you need? What do I need to do? Right? Um, So just being willing to listen and have that conversation and allowing this to move through the body, which goes into what I mentioned earlier, you may cry through this time. Mm -hmm. Or maybe you notice that you need to scream into a pillow. Like all of these are fine. Maybe you need to jump up and down. The feelings wheel pillow. The feelings wheel pillow. Yeah, exactly. That'd be great. So any of those are fine. But what you want to do is kind of listen to the body. Like what does it need to help the energy actually move through in this moment? Right. So for some people that, that may be crying for some people that may be doing jumping jacks. You might want to take a walk. You may just need Mm -hmm. to breathe and continue with the chest tapping. It doesn't matter. Whatever that is totally fine. And then the E in pause is establishing the new identity. So you figured out why the sadness is there. You figured out what it needs from you. Now establishing the new identity is basically like, who do I want to be and what action do I want to take now that I've figured this out? And so maybe that, that means that you need to have a conversation. Or maybe that means you need to do some journaling, or maybe it's telling you that you need to set a new boundary. Maybe um, you felt like a boundary was violated, right? Um, in this particular instance, maybe um, maybe you, you change your settings on Facebook just to, to have some space, right? Like It's not that you're not happy for your friend. You're just not in a place where you want to see all the pictures right mm-hmm. now, right? Um, and this can be hard because some, some folks are, are prone to um, associate themselves negatively or label themselves negatively. So I think it's, like you said, that I, I like the aspect of journaling because it, it can extend that time because mm-hmm. it may take you, you know, you, I think the whole point is you come away from that, maybe right at that moment, it's not the best identity that you're, that, that's coming out, mm-hmm. but give yourself space to kind of move through it a little bit as you journal and reflect and, and your body, pro- you may go to sleep and wake up the next day and go, Oh, okay. sometimes the awareness of why it's there is enough information. Mm-hmm. Right. And sometimes it's just the tip of the iceberg. Right. Right. And yep. so I do often recommend journaling prompts to my clients so that mm-hmm. they can have, com- have deeper conversations with these parts of themselves right. or they can just free flow express. And again, that, that free flow journaling where there's no rules is another way of tapping into that subconscious. Cause have you ever started writing and you have no idea what's going to come out, but mm-hmm. you're, you're talking to an emotion or you're journaling about a thought or feeling you have, and then you get it out. Not only do you feel better, but you came away with like 10 new realizations about right. like why that was bothering you in the yeah. first place. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 So there you go. So pause is what I recommend that people do to assist them in moving through. So P is for parasympathetic. A is to assess the emotion. U is to understand its purpose. S is to support the emotions moving through. And E is to establish the new identity. So that's something that we can do in a just a plethora of ways. And the way I described it here is is definitely something like I wanted to provide all of you with a tool that you can use at home easily and, and effortlessly. This is something that you can, um, you know, mix and match and kind of figure out what works for you. And 
This is also something that can be used in coaching sessions, whether it's, um, you know, with me or other practitioners that have different like varieties of this. But I, mm -hmm. I find that it's really important through this process to work with practitioners because they see it from a different lens and they're able to give you different tools right. that maybe you wouldn't think about in the moment. Right. So a lot of times when we are processing emotions in a one to one call, we end up doing a lot of other things to actually assist the um, resolution of those beliefs or those emotions, whether it's energy work or visualization or meditation, or actually talking to the part or, um, you know, talking to the um, symbolically like people that uh, the like, let's say you have anger towards a person. Sometimes we will have conversations with those people, you know, sometimes I'll create journaling prompts or like there's so many, or we'll do a, a timeline therapy in the session where we're, we're actually resolving the event that it came from. So there's so many different things that we can do in coaching sessions to take this 10 layers deeper. So if you mm -hmm. do find that you're practicing this, then it's really helpful, which you will, because it is like, it, like anybody at any level of their healing process can do this and find it helpful. And if you find that you're still coming up against these walls, and you're like, listen, I've done the pause method like 10 times. This emotion still keeps coming up, but I don't know how to resolve it. Definitely book a call because that we can just do the deeper level work there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Any other thoughts about navigating uncomfortable emotions or what they mean or um, how to square your body? I think the um, the the other part of when when you go through this um, and you process emotions, be very mindful of self care. So you know your brain working very hard. You know it needs support. It needs healthy food. It needs water. It needs things like that. You know don't don't go through a thing and be like oh that felt great and then go grab you know a, a, you know a six pack of beer. You know that that you just have to be really careful and support your body through this process because it's working very, very hard. Yeah. Um, as it works through these emotions. And even if you cry, you get dehydrated. Oh my gosh. And, yeah. You know, and, 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 and your lymph is probably moving. Your lymphatic system is probably moving stuff yeah. too, as you, you know, so your, your body's an energetic thing and you want to support it as best you can. So yeah. you just keep that in mind as you're processing through some things. Yeah. Um, I think that's really good. A lot of times when, pe when you do emotional processing sessions or go to therapy or something and you're, you, dealt with like a big emotion, you'll always hear the advice, go drink a lot of water. I'm thinking about when we did our disclosure, my, our, my therapist said, I wouldn't recommend you go have, have drinks. And <laughs> we, we, went, we, <laughs> yeah, we did. And then it got a little emotional. So it was like, maybe he was right. Yeah. Yeah. Wait, laughing a lot and then we cried a lot too yeah, yeah um so. no do, it, do what you need to do that's right that's right but just something to think about i mean you know sometimes i don't want you know this is not a value judgment on alcohol that might be something that you you do need but just be really you know listen to your whole body and listen to you want to support it it's working hard through these processes it took a lot of pain and trauma to get there and it's going to take hard work and yeah. effort to get away from there too so yeah. that's that's the best way to think about it and just talking about what you were what you were saying in, in terms of listening to your body to make new decisions. Um, like I was on a client call yesterday, and essentially what we were getting to in the call is that she is um, someone that is very uh, empathetic, mm -hmm. and um, her her life and her parenting and 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 everything uh, takes a lot of energy, and it's a lot of output for her to care for other people, right? Mm -hmm. And and that's a truth that I think a lot of parents can relate to, and right. particularly people that are are givers and caretakers and and empaths and things like that, right? There's just a lot of there's a big energy exchange there, and and her kind of takeaway in terms of you know next steps was um, needing kind of what you were talking about with self care we were talking about how can you engage in activities that spark your soul and, and light the fire for you about who you are as an individual separate from all of these other relationships, right? Mm -hmm. Just you, just something only for you. That is um, not about being a wife. That's not about being a friend. That's not about being a mom. It's just about like, who are you yeah. and what, what can fill your cup. And that's really important when you're doing this work, especially because it is very draining. And when you're doing, hard work like this in under the umbrella of addiction and betrayal recovery, it, it can be so exhausting because all of these emotions are, they take up so much space. Right. And so finding those things, I think we talked about this in a recent episode, but finding those things that really make you happy mm -hmm. that, um, you know, can, can spark your creativity and your inspiration and make you feel more safe and relaxed and okay just in who you are as a human being can be really, really helpful. Absolutely.
Yeah. Well, we hope that these um, this conversation and the pause method is helpful as you move forward. We would love to hear from you. If this podcast has been helpful, please leave us a five-star review. It helps get the information and the resources out to others who need it. And we are just so, so thankful for each of you that tunes in and listens every week. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. If you found this podcast interesting or helpful, it would mean so much if you leave a five-star review or post a screenshot and share on social media. We are on a mission to share the message of recovery and you can help get the word out. If you know a friend who could use this podcast, please share it.